So once again, uh, grab a hymnal and a Bible, and we're turning to Psalm 7. I said in the announcements that you won't see really a greater contrast than you, than you will today in these two chapters of the Psalms, or these two Psalms, these words of God. And they're both uh, Psalms of David, but so very different. Uh, first, before we dig into the words of Psalm 7, I want to comment on the general trend or trajectory of the Psalms as we're going through. So I wrote a bunch of this stuff up here. On this side, I, the first eight Psalms that we will have gotten through today, and I, I tried to classify them. There's a number of ways that you can classify some of these. But you remember that Psalm 1... Blessed is the man, right? You've got the righteous and the wicked. You've got the two ways, the way of faith and unbelief. Psalm 2, you are my son, today I've begotten you. A royal and messianic psalm, a direct prophecy about Christ. Written by David concerning the, uh, the father begetting the son and sending him to save us. Now, you had three laments in a row, three, four, and five. Another lament we'll study today, and then Psalm 6, a penitential psalm. Then we get to a psalm of praise. Now, it's very good that Psalm 8 is a psalm of praise. Obviously, many of the psalms are psalms of praise. And the Hebrew word for the book of Psalms is tehillim, which means praises. But as you found out already, not every psalm is strictly one of praise. But again, ones of thanksgiving or lament or imprecatory or royal or wisdom, different genres. So look over here now. There are five books or sections to the psalms. I introduced that in week one. Okay, when we get to the end of book one, I'll tell you, this is the end, here's, here's book two, and so on. So five books of the Psalms. So you can trace how many Psalms of Lament are in each of the five books of the Psalms. So there's 19 in book one, that's, that's through Psalm 89, okay? Most of them are in book one. There's seven in book two, seven in book three, five in book four, and four in book five. So it, the, the laments tend to decrease. However, the, the psalms are organized. This is one trend that you see. Psalms of praise, not very many at the beginning. Only four in book one and four in book two. None in book three, but then there's nine in book four. And by the end of the Psalter, you have 13 psalms of praise. So do you see how the trend is not only within a psalm to go from lament to praising God, but within the entire book, the, the trajectory is one of increasing praise to God and I also mentioned that David's laments are often private and individual, personal. Whereas once you get into the Psalms of Ascent and the Psalms that are in for worship, this is more of a public and corporate sort of worship setting for Psalms. <coughs> so keep that in mind, the general trend as we are going through the book of Psalms. Any question about that or what we talked about the last couple of weeks? <coughs> I won't treat the musical terms in the, in the title or the heading because we did that last time. We talked about Shagayan and we talked about Gittith and we talked about uh, the Sheminith and these stringed instruments and whatever other musical settings or instruments might be referred to here. So we'll just dig right into Psalm 7. Why don't we take it in a few parts? Uh, could I ask one of you to start us with Psalm 7 verses 1 to 5? I'll take a volunteer. Edith, please go ahead. O oh Lord, my God, in you do I take refuge. Save me from all my pursuers, pursuers and deliver me. Lest like a lion they tear my soul apart, rending it in pieces with none to deliver. O oh Lord, my God, if I have done this, if there is wrong in my hands, if I have repaid my friend with evil, or plundered my enemy without cause, let the enemy pursue my soul and overtake it, and let him trample my life to the ground, and lay my glory in the dust. Wow, the, the, these are difficult and dark words, aren't they? <clears throat> Not very uplifting, positive, or cheerful. There are a couple of 
very significant issues that I see when we read, speak, pray, and sing the psalms of this kind, and this one in particular. What stood out to you? How about the graphic language from the very beginning about David's pursuers, lest they tear his soul apart like a lion? What a horrible thing to think about. Who else is compared to a lion in the Bible? The devil. The devil is a roaring lion seeking someone to devour, Peter says in his epistle. And then you can think of real life stories like the judge Gideon tearing that lion apart, right? You can also think positively about Christ our Lord, who is called the lion of the tribe of Judah. So when Christ is on your side, and he is by faith, the lion, the one who fights for you, the strongest and biggest of the beasts. But David has enemies that are like a lion. Let's, uh, let's look at that uh, historical circumstance. Uh, so besides the Shagai and, and the title here, what does it say? Right before 7 verse 1. When did David sing this to the Lord? Or about whom? What does it say? Concerning the words of Cush of Benjamin. Okay, who's Cush of Benjamin? Pretty obscure reference. Huh? <laughs> it's not like, you know, David rejoicing when the ark is brought into Jerusalem. We all know about that and remember that. It's not like the Lord is my shepherd. That's very familiar. And David was a shepherd before he became a king. And it's not even like Psalm 51 where he asked for... God's forgiveness and cleanness after committing adultery with Bathsheba. We know that story very well. This one we don't know as well. So let's let's look it up before we go any further. Who are David's pursuers? Who are his enemies? Why is he praying and singing this to God? Turn now to 2 Samuel chapter 16. 2 Samuel chapter 16. Here is the real life historical narrative that prompted David to write this song. So I said at the end of the last Bible study, some of the songs are love songs. Some of them are the blues or <laughs> laments or they're sad or you're down in the dumps. Some of them are wonderful, joyful outbursts of praise. There's all different emotions and life circumstances in the Psalms. This is not one of the good ones. Second Samuel 16. And as you might recall, one of the earlier Psalms David composed on the occasion of his son, Absalom, trying to take over the entire kingdom and raising up armies and starting a civil war. It doesn't get a lot worse than that. So it's kind of, it's good, I think, to know the historical circumstances when these things are written. What is, this is a part of the same incident, actually, quite a drawn out problem, to say the least. 2 Samuel 16 Uh, we'll start at verse 5. This is uh, what's being referred to here. And I'll read a little bit there. When King David came to Bahurim, there came out a man of the family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shimei, the son of Gera. And as he came, he cursed continually. And he threw stones at David and at all the servants of King David. And all the people and all the mighty men were on his right hand and on his left. And Shimei said as he cursed, get out, get out, you man of blood, you worthless man. The Lord has avenged on you all the blood of the house of Saul, in whose place you have reigned. And the Lord has given the kingdom into the hand of your son Absalom. See, your evil is on you, for you are a man of blood. This is a citizen of the kingdom talking that way to the king. He said these things to King David. Can you believe that? Now in our day, surely no one would say anything negative about our leaders. <laughs> <laughs> I can't imagine something like this. You've never heard of it before, <laughs> past or present, right? <laughs> And what I think is even more interesting is David's reaction. Okay. So you probably didn't stop and think, well, does this fellow have a point? Or is there some truth to his cursing and shouting? 
you probably thought that's that's wrong and that's disrespectful. And yes, it is, right? No one should speak this way to the authorities God has given. On the other hand, what did he think about King David's leadership when David had allowed things to go on in his own family and in his own life when he had stayed behind at his home while his troops and his commander went out to war instead of leading them as he was supposed to do. You know that by now David has already committed great serious and public sins, not just personal private, which are bad enough, but, but others as well. And so this, this fellow is calling the king out for that and not just throwing words at him, but also stones. stones. Yes. He saw a number of years ago that uh, we had a president in a foreign country giving a conference and someone threw his, threw his yeah. shoe. You remember them ducked. And so it was what a terrible thing to see the leader of the whole nation treated that way. And at the same time, try to imagine what would lead someone to do something like that and show that kind of disrespect to another leader or, or to your own leader, right? So here's what happens afterward. Look at verse 9. Then Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, said to the king, uh, by the way, that's uh, David's sister, Zeruiah, and his nephew, Abishai. He had family in his government. He said, why should this dead dog curse my lord, the king? Let me go over and take off his head. But the king said, what have I to do with you, you sons of Zeruiah? If he is cursing because the Lord has said to him, curse David, who then shall say, why have you done so? And David said to Abishai and to all his servants, behold, my own son seeks my life. How much more now may this Benjamite leave him alone and let him curse for the Lord has told him to. It may be that the Lord will look on the wrong done to me and that the Lord will repay me with good for his cursing today. You probably did not expect that reaction from the king, and I didn't. And I, so, I mean, he actually credits the, the Lord with this. So a very complicated, complex, difficult situation in which King David is. He is retreating and fleeing for his life his son Absalom has taken up arms against him and led an army into his capital and palace and tried to take over the country. This fellow comes out and curses him and throws rocks at him. His nephew wants to slaughter the guy. David says, no, let it be. Let the Lord take care of it. It's a mess, isn't it? Now, you, you probably think that things today or in the last year or two or four or eight have been crazy and unprecedented. But keep in mind that King Solomon said this, David said, there's nothing new under the sun. And that means that in the grand scope of history, maybe not in my lifetime or your lifetime, but th there's nothing really unprecedented. Right? Things have often been a mess and a disaster. What else would you say about this lowest of low points in the reign of God's blessed holy King David? <laughs> that situation we've described. So try to not quite get yourself into David's shoes, but start to understand a little bit about what he's writing and singing and lamenting to God about. That as his family and his kingdom are falling apart around him, what should he do? What shall he say and sing and pray to the Lord? So that's that's part of the context of Psalm 7. Please. But he said the Lord told him to do that. David must be feeling kind of guilty. Yes, I would say so. I would think so. What's interesting, and I was just talking to a couple of other people about this recently. We can't always check every claim of the people in the Bible. And what I mean by that is David says the Lord told him to do it. Well, we don't have a written record of that in the scriptures. You can look at the context before and after. Maybe it's true. That, that God had told Shimei to do this. And maybe David's just assuming it and thought that it, he deserved it in a sense, that, that kind of harsh, disrespectful critique. And, or like you said, it could just be his, his guilt that he uh, isn't gonna stick up for himself at this point because things are going so badly and he does feel that, that he is responsible. We would say definitely that he does bear 
a lot of responsibility. Even though Absalom is wrong to rebel and to try to take over the country, David's personal and political failures have, have played some part in this and led to it in, in some sense. So we don't know. And then the other thing, of course, is that uh, it was Cush of Benjamite. So maybe that's a different name for this guy, or maybe it was another circumstance, but that your footnote or cross-reference does refer to this. And Benjamite, okay, so David is from the tribe of Judah, right? So he's from one kind of state or tribe. And his predecessor, Saul, was from the tribe of Benjamin, another state or tribe, okay? So there's that rivalry. Usually, the, a peaceful transition of power, like between David and Solomon, would be the monarchy stays in the family, and it gets handed down from father to son. And there's not a big war and bloodshed and assassination and intrigue and all this stuff, right? But between Saul and David, not a peaceful transition, right? Saul dies in battle in a very dishonorable way, and the kingdom is taken away from him and not given to Jonathan, his son, or to any of his sons, but rather to someone from a different family, a different tribe, King David, whom Samuel anointed years earlier. I mean, already while Saul is king, they anointed his successor. It, it, this was a really huge, difficult controversy. And, and before David's reign is established and there's peace and victory over his enemies and they can finally build the temple, the house of God, these really difficult times happen. So it, hopefully that, that's a little bit of a foundation to review, refresh, and remind about when, why, and how did David write and sing this song to the Lord. Okay. Anything else? Let's go back to uh, Psalm 7 then. Save me from all my pursuers. David had literally been pursued throughout the country, in and out of the cities, in and out of caves and other hiding places. That's, what, that's how King Saul treated him years earlier. So, and some of the Psalms will give that inscription on the top. David wrote this, right, on the occasion of Saul trying to kill him. So you can see some of the things that he went through, some that, that were through no fault of his own, and some that were through some fault of his own. In any case, a good response is to lament, pray, praise, ask God for help, confess our sins, and then rejoice, praise, give thanks, and be healed and comforted with Christ's peace. So there, there is a confession here in verse 3. Oh, Lord, my God, if I have done this, if there is wrong in my hands, if I've repaid my friend with evil or plundered my enemy without cause, so he's... he's saying, you know, if I deserve this, then let it all come down on me. But if I'm innocent, deliver me and destroy my enemy. See, that's a good godly prayer to pray. And we may not feel comfortable saying it. And on any given Sunday morning or Monday night when we're hearing this or praying it, it seems really foreign and doesn't always fit my personal life circumstances. But it's still good to, to sing it. It's still good to say it, pray it, and learn it. Okay, so now he turns and he, and this might even be a little more difficult, these next few verses, six through 11. I'd like to call on one of you to read, please. Psalm seven verses, thank you, Bonnie, six to 11. Arise, O Lord, in your anger. Lift yourself up against the fury of my enemies. Awake for me, you have appointed a judgment. Lest the assembly of the people be gathered about you, over it return on high. The Lord judges the people. Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness, according to the integrity that is in me. O let the evil of the wicked come to an end, and may you establish the righteous, you who test the minds and hearts of the righteous God. My shield is with God, who saves the upright in heart. God is a righteous judge, and the God who feels indignation is so perhaps some uh, even more difficult text here in the middle of Psalm 7. We would definitely agree that the Lord judges the peoples in verse 8. He is the judge. He's described that way. We have no problem with that. 
Maybe we're not as comfortable praying in verse uh, 6. Arise, O Lord, in your anger. Lift yourself up against the fury of my enemies. So if we have, a, and perhaps it's out of a godly desire to be peaceful and loving, because Christ does tell us to love our enemies, yes? Can we also then pray the prayer of Psalm 7? Lift yourself up against the fury of my enemies. Can we somehow also pray for God to deal justly with? Yeah, I, somehow, yeah. Perhaps there's a, a conditional prayer and request and plea and lament. If my enemy will repent and believe and turn and do good as a result, bless him, forgive him, help him, save him. If he won't, deliver me from him whatever means necessary, right? Destroy him, lay him in the dust, banish him, do whatever it takes. And, and Christ has done this on the cross for us already. He has defeated our worst enemy. You think that your worst enemy is the, the person perhaps you're arguing with or the politician, or you think that it's uh, the foreign enemies attacking and so on, but those are not your greatest enemies. Who are your greatest enemies? The devil and the, and the forces of darkness, right? The ones we heard about this morning in the last two weeks and we'll hear about during Lent, right? Our struggle is not with flesh and blood, but with the spirits of the power of the air, right? The, the enemy that you can't see usually is the most dangerous. And is in fact the one orchestrating all the evil that you do see, right? We would say that it, it is the fault of the devil and his hellish crew that things like this happen in our world today, just like back then. So we can and we should, especially against the devil, pray that God would appoint a judgment, that he would lift himself up against the fury of our enemies. And we can somehow pray that and ask that at the same time as loving our enemies and wanting them to be saved and ultimately stop being our enemies, right? We, we don't desire anyone to be our enemy. So this is, it's a difficult passage. Maybe just as difficult is uh, verse 8. The Lord judges the peoples. Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness. Okay, <laughs> we're getting a little uncomfortable. Your Lutheran flag is on the play, and you're thinking, well, hold on, King David. <laughs> Because it's easy to look back on his life and say, well, look at all of his failures. Obviously, his righteousness wasn't that great. What's not as easy is to look at my life and say, I, I too have sinned and fallen short. I, I have no basis to approach the throne of grace on my own righteousness. It gets worse. Yeah. The, integrity. <laughs> the integrity that's in me. <laughs> Don't just imagine praying this to God. Actually pray it to him and, and struggle with the difficulty of what it means. What does it mean? How can David pray and ask God to judge him according to his righteousness and the integrity that is in him? I, I think of it as God, God, oh, God, the Father only sees us through Christ's judgment. Yeah. Now, I know this is before that, but, you know, that doesn't, that, I don't think of my righteousness the same way with before that. I think of God's will be done yes. in the same way. You know, not me choosing which is my enemy and, you know, striking dead now, you know. I just think of it as we, God sees us through Christ, through the veil of Christ. He does. And it, only in this way can I ever talk about my righteousness. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Yeah, what else? And also we have to remember that this is Old Testament where people are judged by their actions. Yeah, there's a, there's a number of places where it appears that, uh, that the, the, the judgment is according to the righteousness or the outward works. You see, like, for example, that Noah walked with God, or Moses repeatedly says things like, if you walk in my ways and in my commandments, right? So very much, it, it seems to be focused on the law and the works and the righteousness, but you have to factor in that. And this is very important in the Old Testament and perhaps the most important thing. Look at Abraham, 
He did what? And God credited that to him as righteousness. Before he was circumcised, before he brought sacrifices to worship, before he did any good works, he what? He believed. And God counted that to him as righteousness. And that's true of Adam and Eve. That's true of Noah. Even when it's when they talk about judging according to the works and, and my righteousness, the faith has got to come first. The saving gift of God by which alone we are saved. So even when it's talking now, it factor in also Christ on the last day, looking at you who have fed the hungry and visited those sick and in prison, right? He does judge according to your works on the last day. It's very difficult and very uncomfortable for us. We are not saved or justified by our works, okay? We cannot gain any merit or get to heaven or be right with God or with each other by our good works, the, the outward performance of righteousness. But on the last day, seeing the fruit and the result of our faith, the good works, that flow out of it, that, that actually is part of the basis for judgment, isn't it? We're called a sheep by God's grace and mercy. He lists our good works as part of the judgment. Now, let me give it just to muddy the waters. Here's another possibility. My righteousness and the integrity that is in me. There, uh, some of the early interpreters looked at that and said, well, there, there is an inner and an outward righteousness. And I think we'd agree to that. The inner righteousness that I just talked about is faith. It's a gift of God. It's not something you do, it's something you receive, right? It's a free gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast for by works of the law, no one will be made right in his sight over and over, right? Back in the Old Testament and in the New, all people everywhere for all times. There's the outward righteousness, and even Aristotle and Plato and the, the pagan Greek philosophers talk about this. They didn't believe in Jesus. They didn't believe in the God of Israel, but they still talk, they use the word righteousness, and they're talking about being good, being nice, doing good things, helping people that need it, pay your taxes, mow your lawn, wave hi and goodbye, you know, just politeness, kindness, goodness, you know, these outward civic virtues. And so some of the interpreters thought that, well, David is uh, talking about his righteousness, perhaps compared to the folks who are attacking him, right? His righteousness, the, the outward works and the sense of comparing, I'm called, God called me to be the king, right? Not Absalom, not this guy who's cursing me, not anyone else who may want to take over, right? So judge me according to, to those things too. I, I don't think that that one stands up as well. But that's another possibility and very difficult. There's other places he talks about his righteousness. And there are some notable commentators who have thought that he's talking about his outward status and works. And not uh, he, what he's certainly not talking about is contradicting the other parts of scripture, right? And if, if so, he, he wouldn't be correct, right? Because we know that no one is saved by any righteousness that he produces of his own will. Right, the righteousness that you have, and you do have saving righteousness, is a gift, and it's purchased and won for you by Christ on the cross and resurrection, and he gives it to you by faith. He gave it to Abraham, he gave it to David, he gave it to Bathsheba and to Solomon, and to his saints of old, and also to you, his saints of the New Testament. So let the reader understand when you talk about my righteousness and the integrity that's in me. So he, he, he goes back and forth and back and forth between, you know, lift yourself up against the fury of my enemies in verse 6. Let the end of the wicked, come, let the evil of the wicked come to an end in verse 9, right? And it will even get more violent in the final few verses. But then there's this positive praise of God, too. You who test the minds and hearts, righteous God. See that this, before he even finishes a stanza, he's praising God as the righteous one without whom no one can be righteous, right? My shield is with God who saves the upright in heart. God is a righteous judge and he feels indignation every day. That was a difficult thing that we mentioned last week about, uh, where did we mention hate about the Lord hating evil and how uncomfortable we are with that word? Uh, does God feel indignation every day? 
<laughs> See, or is, is David just feeling a lot of indignation and saying, well, if I'm having this kind of day, surely the Lord does too. <laughs> to, uh, to love good and truth means that we ought to, and we must also hate evil and lies. That it just goes together. If you love marriage, you hate adultery. Right? If you, if you love peace, you hate violence. That, that's just how it goes, right? It's, uh, there's, uh, to take away something good is something that we should rally against and pray for an end to, and God come and judge and destroy and uh, do what is right and conquer our enemies for us. That, that, that is a good thing and a solid Christian tradition of that going back into the Old Testament. So, again, spiritual enemies being the, the worst and most important, but, but all our others as well. God help us and deliver us. Let's finish this song. It doesn't get easier. <laughs> I'm sorry to say. Uh, verses 12 to 17. I'll call on the first hand, please. 12 to 17. Thank you. If a man does not repent, God will wet his sword. He has bent and readied his bow. He has prepared for him his deadly weapons, making his arrows fiery shafts. Behold, the wicked man conceives evil and is pregnant with mischief and gives birth to lies. He makes a pit, digging it out, and falls into the hole that he has made. His mischief returns upon his own head, and on his own skull his violence descends. I will give the Lord the thanks due to his righteousness, and I will sing praise in the name of the Lord the Most High. See, all is well that ends well. <laughs> the psalm ends well, doesn't it? It's a, a praise and thanksgiving to the Lord due to his righteousness. What a helpful, good, correct, not corrective, but knowing the source of our righteousness. But don't let me skip to that so easily and quickly. I, and I think we could all agree with verses 14, 15, and 16, right? And you see very often that in this life, not always, but often, those who do evil deeds don't do well and succeed and, and unfortunately make their lives difficult, unhappy, financially unsuccessful, mentally, emotionally, spiritually problematic. They hurt others too. They drag themselves and others into this pit. That, that we can kind of see and, and agree to in a general sense of observing human life and evil and the results of it. What's so much more difficult is verses 12 and 13. Because we know and we confess and we believe in the one true God who is a God of mercy and compassion and he's long suffering and patient. He doesn't want anyone to perish. So how can you pray verses 12 and 13 and picture God wetting his sword and bending and readying his bow with his deadly weapons and his arrows, his fiery shafts if a man doesn't repent? Yeah, I mean, it's the flip side of his mercy. It's not complete, but I mean, God's merciful to those in his or that are bound up in his grace, but those outside of his church, he has, I mean, he has to carry out the law. Yes. Um, I was like. And reading that originally, I didn't think initially about God doing it, other than God working through governing authorities to carry out his judgment. He does do that. He really does do that. And you see it all the time. This is why he's instituted earthly government, including David's government. Even as weak or corrupt or challenging of a time as he was going through there, God was still maintaining order. He was restraining evildoers and punishing them. He was rewarding those who do well, in an, again, in an outer, civic, observable righteousness kind of way. And yes, it's true. I mean, there are so many ways that you have arrows and weapons and swords of God, not the least of which, never underestimate this, is a guilty conscience, right? That you feel badly when you said that, that wicked thing or failed to do the right thing you were supposed to do, right? So if a man doesn't repent, and so that, that's just it, right? The punishment that awaits those who don't believe, 
you confess it every Sunday that we deserve God's temporal, right here and now, and eternal punishment, right? And that's a just and right thing. What's astounding and amazing and even more powerful and, and certain, true, and hopeful <laughs> is that he goes above and beyond his justice. He's not only a God who is just, right, true, good, and fair. He is also the God of mercy. He is the God of compassion. He is the God of love and forgiveness. He doesn't give you what you deserve. As far as the bad stuff, he does give you all kinds of things you don't deserve. As far as the good stuff, he is constantly, always overflowing with love and grace and mercy. And even to those who deserve the arrows and swords of his judgment and justice, he's patient with them too. And, and that's why we think, why hasn't he come back yet? How can he allow this evil to continue? He is, he is actually giving the folks who are currently actively rejecting and fighting him and his church and his people time to repent, time to listen to the invitation, time to turn from their evil ways and be saved by the Holy Spirit and proclaiming the gospel. That's why these things are still going on the way as they are. God is patient, far more patient than you or me, because we would have ended it all long ago and not given them another chance. But God is, and he does. So even the lament, this often happens, ends with the thanks due to Christ's righteousness and singing praise to the name of the Lord, the Most High. Now, why is Lord in all capital letters? Why is it in all capital letters? Sometimes Lord is not in all capital, and then it's a title, right? It's, it's like boss, chief, head, president, you know, that kind of thing, like a title. But Lord in all capitals is Yahweh. That's the personal name of God. That's his first name. That's the name by which he wants to be known and be, be prayed to and called upon. And it means he is, right? The one who is. I am the one who is and was and always will be, right? So when you see that capitalized, that's the English translation bringing out. This isn't just any Lord. This is the Lord. This is Yahweh. This is his personal name by which he wants to be called upon in praise and prayer and worship. Okay? So it's a great bridge into the next psalm, and we're going to sing it. So please get out your hymnal and turn to psalm number eight. We'll sing it, and then we'll talk about it. It is such a beautiful hymn of praise. It is wonderful and glorious. Uh, the sun and the moon and the stars, we talk about God's creation. We talk about humanity. What is man? And we talk about Christ. What is the son of man? And so I'll switch this here. I'm going to go over there and uh, accompany our singing. You probably notice that when we sing, there's a, little, there's a line at the end of towards the end of the line and that's where the music changes i mean you've done this for years and i'm not telling you anything new but that's that's where the notes change and there's always three of them so i'll play through the tone once and then we'll sing together psalm 8. Thank you. 
singing. It is always good to sing to the Lord and to make music and bless his name. And of all the wonderful instruments out there, the greatest one is the, voice. the human voice. Yeah. Cello. I, and that's, that'd be a close second, right? <laughs> Except that the pipe organ's already second, sorry. <laughs> the king, yeah. <laughs> there are so many good ones. And when they all sing together in this glorious, wonderful harmony, we give thanks to our Lord because he created music. Uh, I, I like to listen to a lot of different kinds. And uh, often the artist thinks that he is channeling the divine or that he is making something uh, very special and sacred when actually it's quite the other way around, isn't it? That God is the giver of music and of tones and of instruments and voices. And he is the one who helps us blend together in harmony. And best of all, not just to make any music, but to make wonderful church music that praises God and gathers his saints together into the song, the, the song that endures forever, the song of worship that goes on and on. We'll spend a lot more time on this later, but we sing every Sunday an introit, which is bits of a song. We sing a gradual, which is verses from a song. When we sing matins, we sing an entire song, usually beginning to end, and always end with that little hymn, that four line part, the Gloria Patri, right? Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. What a perfect way to end each song. Now you can sing all of them, they're all marked for singing, but Psalm 8, a, a song of praise to the choir master, a psalm of David. Do you imagine the king writing the choir anthem for you? You'd better practice it and have it down well, <laughs> right? Because he, he's the one writing it and uh, giving it to you, maybe with the music and the words. Okay? Oh Lord, our Lord. So have you, uh, have you ever heard Hebrew? If you ever listen to Hebrew, maybe you have a long time ago. Um, just, just so you know what it sounds like. Um, this is the original language that's written in. There's a song out there too. I almost brought a recording uh, where this, this whole thing is sung in Hebrew. A uh, pretty modern kind of contemporary take on it. But this is what it sounds like when you start in the Hebrew, it's verse two. And I'll just read that one verse. Uh, oh Lord, our Lord, how? Okay. So Yahweh Adonenu, Ma Adir Shimka, Veko Haaretz, Asher Tana Hodka Al Hashamayim. Now I, I didn't read it very well, but you ask a Jewish person or a Hebrew person, and they will read it much better and uh, so that's what it sounds like in Hebrew. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You set your glory above the heavens. And so on the one hand, we are definitely thinking about nature and all the earth. And you set your glory above the heavens. So heavens and the earth just refers to everything. Everything everywhere the whole universe, earth, outer space, the planets, time, energy, all of it, all creation. That's how the Hebrews called it, the heavens and the earth. 
the stuff up there and the stuff down here, right? All of it, the heavens and the earth. So you've set your glory above the heavens. Now you think upon reading this at first and singing and praying it, well, his glory is way out there and it's way up there and we can't get to it. And in fact, that's the original sin is trying to get up there ourselves and trying to ascend like the devil did to the seat of power and to God's throne and to take over and take things for ourselves. But instead what happens is quite the opposite. By the time you get to verse four and five, the son of man, you have made him lower, verse five, than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. Who is this about? Jesus. It's about Jesus, right? And it's quoted repeatedly in the New Testament as being about Jesus. So instead of us trying to get up there to find his glory above the heavens, Jesus comes down. That's what it means that he's made a little lower than the heavenly beings. He did not come as a mighty invisible angel that can travel faster and, and more powerfully than we can, but as one of us, as a son, of, as the son of man. Jesus calls himself son of man more than any other title. And it's a very Old Testament title. Ezekiel and Daniel and many of the prophets, the Lord calls them son of man. Go and prophesy. Uh, but Jesus is the son of man. Right? Son of God and Son of Man, eternally begotten of the Father, conceived by the Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary here in time in our place as one of us. So that's the overall scope of this wonderful psalm. So that it, it is a, a hymn of praise, but it is best of all, it is a messianic. You would add that. It, it's about the Messiah. It's about Jesus Christ, and it's a prophecy about him. This is quoted in Hebrews. Three entire verses out of this short psalm are quoted in Hebrew, so we already looked at it back then when we studied it. It's quoted by St. Paul in 1 Corinthians when he talks about the resurrection and about Jesus ascending and all things being put under his feet, right, where he now reigns and rules at the Father's right hand for us. Jesus also quotes it, so please keep your finger here and turn to Matthew chapter 21. Where does Jesus quote this? I'm always interested in how the New Testament writers quote the Old Testament. And, and when we get to something important like this, I want to see, especially when it's Jesus, what does he say? How does he use the Psalms in his teaching and his ministry? How does he apply them to himself? Not that they ever weren't about him, but that he focuses on those clearest prophetic passages, even in the Psalms about him. The date was Palm Sunday. The very first, uh, where is it? It is uh, Matthew 21 verse five includes a couple of prophecies. One is from Zechariah and one's from Isaiah. So, and then look, there's another one in verse nine. That's from the Psalms. Blessed is he who comes in the Name of the Lord. You just sang that this morning in the Sanctus. That's from Psalm 118. They sang that every year when they went up to Jerusalem for the Passover. We sing it every week as the Lord comes to us with his body and blood. Now look at me. Yeah, there it is. Matthew 21, verse 16. Um, I can't imagine anyone crankier than the chief priests and the scribes. Because they hear all the children crying out, Hosanna to the son of David, and they were... They were indignant. <laughs> Someone quiet those kids down, <laughs> right? If you can imagine. And so then what does Jesus reply? Amen. So our Lord Jesus gently reminds them, haven't you ever read the Bible? <laughs> right? What about in Psalm 8? where it says, out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies, you have prepared praise. That is a wonderful, amazing image. And Jesus quotes it, and it's about his entry into Jerusalem to save us from our sins, his dying and rising on the cross, his being made lower than the angels, but then crowned with glory and honor. We call it his humiliation and then his exaltation. You remember that from catechism.
Okay, let's go back to the psalm. There's a lot more we could do in the New Testament, but Psalm 8. Uh, obviously, the more general application of this psalm is that it, in a general sense, you can and should say it about all humanity. What is man that you're mindful of him? Maybe you've looked out at night and you've looked up at the, you know, it's a clear night. And, that, and maybe if you're out in the country, it's even better, right? And you can see all the, all the stars. You can see way more sometimes than usual. It's like a big, beautiful canvas and a painting that God made for you. And then every, every once in a while, certain times of the month, you can also see the, the moon in all of its phases. And then a few weeks ago, is this, this is blood red color, wasn't it? Yeah. And then sometimes it's just bright, shining, brilliant white. You can almost see the, the features on it. There's the, the mountain and there's the valley on the moon. The man of the moon. The man of the moon. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so you look at that and then you can sing this with the psalmist. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, that's really special today because not once but twice today in our Bible readings, we heard about the finger of God. First in the Exodus, and it wasn't even Moses saying it. It was the, the wicked, idolatrous magicians of Egypt. And they said, look, Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. There's nothing we can do about it. And still he showed uh, 10 plagues. How many chances did God give Pharaoh to repent? Endless, right? And instead he hardened his heart. This is the finger of God. And then Jesus talks about this finger also in the gospel reading. Right? If it's by the finger of God that I cast out demons, which it is, the kingdom of God has come upon you. So usually you're talking about God's outstretched arm or his right hand to save and deliver you. But here you're just focusing on his, on his finger. It's kind of interesting, right? And, and of course, does God have a finger? Jesus. Jesus does. So yes is the answer. Yes, God has a finger. He's got 10, in fact. <laughs> And ten toes and hair, teeth and eyes, body just like you and me and a soul, and is still true God and true man. He has, right? He is. And so the finger of God, it, it refers in a sense to his power, right? You say things like, i you you've got more strength than your little finger, right? Than someone else in his whole body. And that's true of God compared to all our enemies, it's true of God compared to all creation put together. So you've got the foe, the enemy and the avenger in verse 2, but they're not really defined. That's like the only negative thing in the entire psalm. You had plenty of it in Psalm 7. But when you get to Psalm 8, it is entirely praise and thanksgiving to God for his creation and best of all for his salvation and for his name. This psalm is appointed for uh, the eighth day of Christmas, which is January 1st. Also known as New Year's Day, which we greeted with joy after the year 2020 was finished. New Year's Day, the eighth, because you had Christmas Day, the 25th, and then you count eight days, and the eighth day is, is uh, January 1st. So this psalm is appointed that because Christ was circumcised and named when he was just eight days old. So how majestic is your name in all the earth? The perfect psalm for that day. You've set your glory above the heavens. Now, I want to really zoom in on verse 2 as well. Because Jesus quotes this, who has God prepared praise from or established strength because of? Out of the mouth of babies and infants. Is that, is that really accurate? I mean, they, they can't even talk, really. <laughs> right? And they make noise, yes. What's the difference between babies and infants? Which one's older? Jesus kind of, the, the translation there is the nursing infants, right? So you, you'd have, a, you'd call it like the newborn or the, or the one-year-old. You know, some like a, not much of a distinction, but like tiny babies and, you know, a little bit bigger babies. So does that sound right? I mean, uh, so babies and infants, and sometimes you just have poetic parallelism where things are listed or described. And we're talking about like the very youngest people, right? The tiniest, most helpless, vulnerable, little babes. 
they can't do anything on their own. They can't go anywhere. They can't feed themselves or clothe themselves. These are the folks the Lord has established strength from and ordained praise from. That's incredible, isn't it? Our God loves life from the moment of conception. And the, the little children can hear. They can vocalize. They can let you know they need something. They can pretty soon they can smile, right? And even if they can't do anything, these are the folks that God tells us to become like, right? Unless you become like little children, you'll never enter the kingdom of God. Now, it's, it's not just the metaphor, right? It's not just that all adults should, in their dependency on Christ, become like little children. Because right after that, Jesus also takes the literal tiny little babies and children and puts his hands on them and blesses them, right? The kingdom of God belongs to such as these, you who become like children and the actual babies and children, right? So it's not like they shouldn't be baptized. And it's not like you don't sin until you're seven or eight. Everyone who's had children knows that. <laughs> Everyone who's been a child knows that. <laughs> we, we are all conceived and born in sin, as David will confess in Psalm 51, and, and we all need the mercy and salvation and forgiveness of Christ. And then as a result of that saving faith, even out of the mouth of babies and infants, God establishes strength and ordains praise. That is wonderful. So babies and infants, uh, they belong where? In church, right? And we don't need to always segregate them and have their own special service, right? It is good to have all ages here with us. If you're 105 or if you're two minutes old, right? It is good for the people of God at every age and ability to be gathered together to hear his word and to receive his gifts. Now, obviously, there's other things flowing from that and during the week that we kind of teach and receive according to our ability. But when we hear the word and sing praises and pray the prayers and receive the gifts of God, it is good for all of God's people to be together. And the, the later Psalms really focus on that. Again, when you move from more of the personal ones to the corporate ones, when you have less of the lament, although still there, and more of the praise, you see that more and more in the Psalter. So, there, and there's just so much more. The, the days of creation are all really, in a way, enumerated. It's such a beautiful psalm of creation where he mentions the, uh, so in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? That, that's a one verse summary of the whole, the whole thing, right? That's, that's everything. And then he goes into the different days. On day four, it was the sun and the moon and the stars. But already on day one, it was the light and the dark, right? On day five, you've got the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, which you can't wait to get out there and catch some soon, right? <laughs> Once we get rid of that ice and snow. But uh, already on day two, God had separated the sky from the water, the water below and above, right? And then finally on day six, God populates the land with beasts and with male and female, man and woman, already on day three, he had separated the dry ground and the water, okay? So the six wonderful, beautiful days of creation and the seventh on which he rested, he gives us our own Sabbath, our day of rest and praise and worship. And so then we actually, uh, we, we talk about Christ being made lower than the heavenly beings, crowned with glory and honor, giving of dominion in verse six, just as we're given dominion in Genesis 1 and 2 over all creation to, to be good stewards of the land and the air and the, the animals and the water and trees that God has given us. How much more has Christ been given all authority in heaven and on earth and dominion over all living things and including the sheep and oxen and the beasts of the field and the birds of the heaven and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along there. So this the uh, dominion of God and his glory and his righteousness are universal. They are ultimate. They are everywhere, right? You see his work in creation. You see his work most of all and best of all. And that Jesus was made a little lower for us for a time and then crowned with glory and honor at his resurrection and ascension. Okay. Thought, comment, question, concern on Psalm 7 or on Psalm 8 or on anything whatsoever.
We'll give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his mercy endures forever. Amen. God bless you all.